This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Okay, hi everyone. We'll get started again for CS224N. Okay, so what I want to do today is spend a bit of time um, finishing up the stuff about smoothing probability models that I didn't get to last time. And then after I've done that, um, You'll be kind of two-thirds qualified to do the, fir the first assignment. The other thing I just want to remind people about is that we'll have section on Friday and that section's a really good opportunity to kind of go through concretely and look through some of these smoothing models. And we have some nice Excel spreadsheets um, that Paul and Vijun will show that goes through how some of these things work. And so that'll be useful for the assignment as well. And then after that, I'm going to get into doing alignment models for machine translation. And so really, um, the material today is the heart of what you have to do in the second assignment. So make sure you haven't completely forgotten it um, by the time the second assignment comes along. And then this then um, is material that's covered in a couple of places that you should look at. One place you should look at is chapter 25 of Jurafsky and Martin, which is about machine translation. But another source that's really good to look at and is on the web page, is that there's this machine translation workbook that was written by Kevin Knight. So it was written as a kind of a tutorial set of exercises for a machine translation workshop he ran a bunch of years ago. And it's sort of very concrete and works through examples. It even has a bit of stuff on the language model side as well as the alignment model side. And so that's also a good thing to look through. OK, so where we were last time was this problem of smoothing. We've looked through some data. We have empirical counts of how often different outcomes occurred as to what words occurred after denied the. And our idea is somehow we want to smooth, shave some probability mass off the things that, or count mass off the things that did occur. And so this is referred to often as discounting. And then we kind of need to give it to the, give it to the words that never appeared. Because we have the idea that many of them are possible words that could appear. It's just our data is always too sparse. And so then right at the end, I started um, talking about good chewing, um, smoothing. And I'll just try and say this once more without completely stumbling over myself and see if I can get it right this time. Um, yeah, I mean, it's somehow a little bit confusing what you're counting, but it works out quite straightforwardly in practice. So we have a data set of C, for a large C, it might be a million, 10 million um, tokens of words. So what we're going to do is do C experiments, where for each experiment, we take one word in turn and hold it out. We call this a pseudo test set. So this is like a model of leave one out cross validation. And then we train a mod, we consider a model trained on the remaining C minus one tokens and consider it predicting our one test token. And so then the questions that we ask ourselves is, well, how often will our test token be one that we never saw in the training data? Well, it'll be one that we never saw in the training data if it's a word that occurs only once in the training data, because then when it's held out, it won't occur at all in the C minus one tokens, and then so it'll be a brand new word. So the good Turing estimate for how, how often, what the percentage of time in total you're going to see some unknown word, not, is then the number of words that you saw once in the total training data divided through by the total number of words. And that's the, sort of the event of any unseen token appears, not a particular unseen token appears. And I'll come back to that issue later. OK. Um, well, what fraction of held out words are seen k times in training? Well, a held out word will have been seen k times in the, this, the training data of this experiment if in the entire corpus it occurred k plus one times, because then it'll be the once that's in the held out data and the k times in the reduced training data. Well, how many such words are there? Well, there are nk plus one such words. So the total count mass 
of words, the total count mass of times in which the held out data was seen k times in the training data is k plus one times nk plus one. And so then the fraction of the times that occurs is that divided by the total count of tokens C. Okay, so if in the future um, we expect um, that percentage of the words to be those with training count K, the, and there are actually then in K words with training count K, the way we come up with an estimate for them is to say the expected count of a word with training count K should be taking K plus one times NK plus one divided through by the number of words that occurred K times, which is then NK. And so that bottom equation gives the discounted count to assign to words that occurred K times in the total training data. So for each, for words that occurred with some count in the training data, you're re-estimating them based on words that occurred k plus one times in the total training data following this leave one out thought experiment. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. Um, that sounds really good. Um, if you just literally try and do that, you come up with a big problem. So if, if I, so I told you last time that the most common word in the brown corpus was the, and if I try it out, and use this equation and say, let's re-estimate um, the, the, the discounted count and hence the probability of the, what am I going to get out as the answer? Yeah? Zero. Okay, why do I do that? Well, it's because that is the most common word. And so I say, how many words occurred one time more often than the, the answer is zero. And so the numerator is zero, and the answer is zero. So that's kind of crazy. Um, so if you actually, if you actually, so good Turing um, reweighting is based on a theorem. So this is the same Turing as in the famous Turing came up with this um, in early work. Um, the, the actual math that I'm not doing here that's the derivation of the good Turing, Turing theorem, it doesn't actually just have these empirical counts here. The actual theorem is in terms of model expectations. And so we're just, sort of, I'm just here sort of substituting in the actual empirical counts and doing this leave one out experiment. And that works fine just to use the empirical counts for the words with low empirical counts because there are lots of them and those estimates are reliable, reliable. But once you get out here, it works particularly crazily. I mean, it's most crazy for the most common word to be re-estimated as zero. But in general, the counts are just going to bounce around once you get up, out to the tail. So to actually make this usable, you have to do something different. And the most common method that's used but not the only method, is this simple good Turing method, which was proposed by Gale and Sampson. And essentially what you're doing with that is that you're using, for low count words, you're using the empirical counts of counts. And for high count words, you're just fitting a little power law regression curve through the actual observed counts, and you're using that. And then since that's a monotonically declining function, you're then always getting sensible discount estimates. Okay, and so that's a little slide. I'll leave, you can work through something in section. Um, does this work well? Um, it turns out it works fantastically well. Um, so, well, we discussed last time that another way that you could discount is to use held out data. So here what we've done is say, well, Let's um, initially do counts of bigrams on 22 million words, and then we'll look at a further 22 million words and, of held out data and see how often those bigrams actually occurred in further data. And these are the actual empirical counts. On this side, we instead say, no, let's just look at the empirical counts 
and then do simple good Turing smoothing. And what you can see is um, that the simple good Turing smoothing um, just does a fantastic job at matching what the empirical observed counts are. So it's a good smoothing method. It's extremely um, widely used. I mean, and remember, I mean, of course, you could say, well, if this way works so well, why don't we use this way of doing things? And the reason we prefer not to use held out data is in this experiment we've used, if we had 44 million words of data available to us and we used only half of it for training the model and half of it for doing held out discounting estimation. And well, if we have 44 million words of data available to us, as I'll demonstrate in a few slides time, we'd actually much prefer to use all 44 million words of data um, to train our model. And by taking advantage of the good Turing smoothing idea, we are able to do that. Okay. Um, so, just very briefly then, I mean, cat smoothing takes us into an area of back off, and I want to say a couple of slides about back off. So, to a first approximation to estimate words, um, cat uses good Turing smoothing. Um, he actually uses a variant of good Turing smoothing, which is the following. So, for these words here, here I fit a power law. But another way of working out the probability of these words is to say, well, the empirical estimates for high count words are basically just about right. There's no need to discount them whatsoever because they're actually well estimated. The probability of the that's occurring 4,000 times, we can just use relative frequency and that'll be almost right. If you do that, since somehow you effectively have to discount a teeny bit more mass off the low count words, so you end up with something that's still a probability distribution, which may be a little bit problematic as I'll show later. Okay, um, but Katz's main contribution is then how to make use of this idea of back off so that if, if we have, are trying to do bigram estimates and we've seen a bigram, well then we'll use its discounted estimate using good Turing smoothing. Well, what if we haven't seen a bigram? So we're, trying to, we're wanting to predict the probability of spacious following large and we never saw spacious following large. Well, one thing we could do is just put a uniform estimate over all words that we didn't see following large. But that seems to be underusing the information that we have available. It seems like what we should do is at least use the information about what words are common or uncommon, i.e. use the unigram count of words. So in the absence of other evidence, we predict that large red should have higher probability than large spacious simply because red has higher probability than spacious in our training data. And so in cat smoothing, what you're doing is you're using the good Turing discounted count of the bigram, combining that with an estimate from a unigram count, which is then being renormalized to get a probability distribution. Okay, um, and so that's essentially um, this intuition here, um, that you're using good Turing to um, assign probability to the things that you know about, and then for the things that you don't know about, good Turing tells you in aggregate how much probability mass to give them, but you're then using backing off to a lower order n-gram to divide that mass among different possible word candidates. Um, now, the, there's a catch here, and the catch here is this works fine for words that you saw somewhere, but just not in a particular context, right? The assumption of what I just said before was that you had seen the words spacious and red. Um, you just hadn't seen them after large, so you could use their unigram counts. Um, well, what about words you never saw in the training data at all? They're generally referred to in the speech and language world as OOV items, out of vocabulary items. And we still need to do something about those. We haven't solved that problem. And I'll 
come back to that um, in a minute. Okay, um, but before I do that, I'll introduce one, one and a half last um, smoothing ideas. And so this is the idea of Knesset I smoothing. And so Knesset I smoothing is sort of basically the state of the art these days. And the observation of Knesset I smoothing is the following. Well, this, this idea of backing off to lower order n-gram models, which we saw both in cat smoothing and also in linear interpolation, there's something fundamentally broken about that. Because what, what happens is if you have a sentence of there was an unexpected and you're considering the probability of seeing Delay or Francisco next, um, and you never saw unexpected Delay or unexpected Francisco in your training corpus, then you back off from a bigram or a trigram to the unigram, and you're simply asking yourself which of these two words is most common as a unigram count. And suppose, you know, quite likely for an American newspaper, if that's your data source, Francisco will actually have a much higher unigram count than delay does. And so you'll predict that you're more likely to see Francisco than delay. And that seems fundamentally crazy because actually, um, well, it says here that Francisco always follows San. That's not quite true, because you can also have Francisco as a name. But 95% of the time in the newspaper, Francisco follows San. So although it has high count mass as a unigram, we should really, really not expect to see it in this, that context. And so the answer that's proposed to that was this idea of Knesset smoothing. And so Knesset smoothing takes that problem heads on and says, well, let me, let me um, try and estimate how likely a word is to occur in novel contexts. Um, and so how could we do that? Well, what we could do is think about how often did we see a word as a novel continuation? Um, I actually changed this slide from the one that was on the handout before. This is now the way it is in Jurafsky and Martin, chapter 4, which I think is slightly more intelligible. So what we're going to ask is, um, for a particular word W, how often did we see it making up a novel continuation, i.e., there was some word minus 1 before it, and then word W appeared. So, well, that's the number of... That's the number of bigrams, word W minus 1, W, which have a count of greater than 0, i.e. we saw them sometime. It doesn't matter how many times we saw it, we've just seen it. So it turns up in a range of different contexts. And then we're just dividing that through by a normalization factor of doing that for all different words W. So we're sort of saying of all of the times when a word some word first appeared after the preceding context, what percentage of that time was at a particular W? So that's measuring how often does it occur in what new places where it hasn't been seen before. Does that make sense? Um, and so that's proven to be a really powerful idea um, that's worked extremely successfully. Um, to make just one little side remark at this point, um, in a lot of areas of probability, everyone, especially in computer science, everyone is very into Bayesian stuff and doing Bayesian probability models. Um, a kind of funny thing about the state of the art of um, using probabilistic smoothing in NLP is that all the really good ideas like this have actually um, come from people you know, scratching their heads and looking at the data and what happens in the estimation and why does it um, go wrong and by the seat of their pants coming up with some formula that seems to capture the right properties. And then what happens after that is then three years later, um, someone writes a conference paper saying um, how this formula can be interpreted as a Bayesian prior and does a big derivation of that. And that's been done for both good Turing smoothing and also um, just recently um, for Kness and I smoothing. And so there's a link on the syllabus um, for a paper by Yi Tay of how to interpret Kness and I smoothing as um, a Bayesian prior. 
But the funny thing is that, you know, none of the actual good ideas of how to come up with a better smoothing method actually seem to come from the theory. They actually seem to come from people staring at bits of data. Okay. Um, okay, so um, that's um, Knesset I smoothing. Um, there's a way that you can do Knesset and I smoothing, um, which is actually a little bit simpler and actually doesn't work so badly. This is the same chart I showed before of the actual discount from held out data and the good Turing estimate. I mean, something that you will notice, at least for this data set, is except for count one words, I mean, a way to, th oh, no, no, I'll say that afterwards. Except for count one words, um, Look at this. It looks like the discount is basically three quarters every time. And if you go up to high accounts, it essentially still looks like the discount is about three quarters each time. So, you know, maybe this good Turing smoothing is more trouble than it's worth. Um, and you could just subtract three quarters from the observed count, um, and you'll be near enough to write. And that's referred to as absolute discounting. And it turns out, you know, that works pretty much as well. Um, and so um, that's a slightly, then that gives you a sort of a slightly simplified version of Knesset I smoothing where you're still using this continuation idea, but you're just putting in a constant discount there rather than doing um, good Turing smoothing. Yeah, um, so coming back to here, I mean, yeah, the sense you get here is, you know, a word that you've seen only once, I mean, it's a little bit of evidence that you've seen it, but it's sort of kind of almost a random thing, right? You might have seen that word, you might have seen a different word. So um, what good Turing smoothing gives you is words that only occurred once are strongly discounted. So the discounted count of it is less than a half, right? So it gets greatly marked down, whereas any higher counts are kind of seem to have this basically constant discount. Okay. Um, so... Um, Stanley Chen and Josh Goodman have done a ton of careful empirical work um, trying out every different smoothing method under the sun. Um, this is one of the charts that appear in their paper as to how different things work. Um, there's sort of a baseline which is doing this held out um, smoothing. Here's cat smoothing. Down here is then Knesset and I smoothing. Um, and, lo and low is good. Right, the lower you are, the better. And then they worked out their own modification of Knesset I smoothing, which I'm not going to talk about, which is a fraction better than Knesset I smoothing. But basically, yeah, to say, basically Knesset I smoothing um, with good Turing discounting embedded in it is sort of the state of the art for smoothing language models. Yes? Uh, it's kind of a glare from the sort of thing. Diff in test cross entropy from baseline bits per token. I, if, if you're reducing the, so this is on a scale of cross entropy, not perplexity, but you're wanting to make the cross entropy as low as possible using the same kind of entropy or perplexity measures as last time. And this is just kind of taking a diff on that rather than looking at the absolute number. Okay. Um, so that's kind of the smoothing technology. Um, the other half of the story is language models work really well if you've got a ton of data. Um, that may not be rocket science, it's true. But, you know, um, this is kind of, in some sense, a slightly sad part of modern NLP, right? That it turns out that for a lot of things, you can try and do really clever things on a small amount of data, or else you can do dumb things on a very large amount of data, and, well, normally doing dumb things on a large amount of data will work just as well. Now, of course, you can have the best of both worlds, and you can do clever things on large amounts of data, and that will be better again. But, you know, if you think about it abstractly, um, you know, you can try and do a clever job at smoothing, and you can do um, good things with that, but, you, you know, it's still kind of having a poke in the dark. If your other choice is to go and collect 100 times more data and then just have a much better sense of which words occur after large with what probability, that that empirical data is just going to be better. And so that's kind of what this chart um, shows. So this is again on a bits of cross entropy scale. And so we're showing different amounts of training data, 100,000 words, a million words, 10 million words, 
and the total data set, gosh, I forget the size now, I think it's around 50 million words um, that was in there. And so what we see is, so for most of recorded history, um, by and large, people have used trigram models, because it's obvious that unigram models are terrible. Bigram models are kind of passable, and in particular applications, it's still often the case that people will use bigram models. Because the counterpoint to my claim of lots of data is good is lots of data is good only if you've got data that's appropriate to the domain. If what you're wanting to do is build a speech recognition system where people are going to be ordering Domino's pizzas, it doesn't really do much good throwing in 100 million words of Wall Street Journal Newswire. That's not going to help your language model. So a lot of the time in, in spoken applications, you know, around 100,000 words of data might be as much or more than the amount of domain appropriate data that you can get your hands on. And well then, you know, absolutely you should just use a bigram model. That doesn't seem much value in doing anything else. Um, for most larger scale things, even just a regular kind of speech recognition like the your 3999 um, speech dictation software you can buy in the bookstore, the standard is trigram models because you're getting a noticeable um, performance boost by going to trigrams. And until quite recently, basically, people didn't go further than trigrams because, as you can see, these kinds of curves were very flat or actually things could even sometimes get worse, certainly with this cat smoothing from overtraining. But once you start getting into hundreds of millions of words or billions of words of training data, you can then clearly um, get value from four grams and start to get value from five grams. So sort of big, huge MT systems um, use tr um, five gram language models quite commonly now. But you should have a sense of the fact that this is getting to be a very difficult game to play because the problem is every time you're increasing the order of your Markov model that you're blowing out the number of parameters that you have to estimate by another factor of your vocabulary size. So if you want to have a vocabulary of something like 100,000 words, well, you have 100,000 minus one unigram parameters. You have um, 10 to the 10 bigram parameters. 10 to the 15 trigram parameters. You know, you very quickly get up into those kind of number of atoms in the universe kind of numbers, and you can't possibly be estimating them all well. Okay. Um, nevertheless, one of the things that's helped people a lot um, for doing large scale n-gram estimation is that a year or so ago, um, that Google released a huge set of n-grams going up to 5 grams done over. Um, how many zeros is this? Is this a trillion? Done over a trillion words of running text. Um, because the amount of data and the potential vocabulary is so high, I mean, actually, it's not exhaustive counts over all n grams of different orders. So in that size of data, they literally actually just threw away any word that didn't occur at least 200 times in their total corpus. And then even for the kind of bigrams, trigrams, et cetera, um, they're being trimmed unless they occur a baseline number of times of 40 times. But nevertheless, you get these kind of enormous tables. So this is a little, um, a little estimate of how commonly, how commonly words were seen after serve as the. And you know, precisely this is the way in which big data helps you a lot because you know, if your choice is you can use Google n-gram data and be able to use a four-gram language model and predict words occurring after serve as the, it's kind of a no-brainer that that's just going to have to give you way, way better estimates of what's going to appear next than having built your own language model over 10 million words of data and be using a trigram model, which is trying to predict the next word based on the preceding context of as the because as that just isn't a very predictive context as to what's going to come next. Okay, there's one more slide on, the, on other things people do, which I'm going to skip. The last thing I want to talk about for language models is this problem, this problem of unknown words. Um, so what do we do about words that we never saw in our training data whatsoever? I mean, what... What is our story for those? Um, well, our story for those actually depends on our application. There are some applications in which we just work 
with a fixed vocabulary. And so unknown words by fiat just don't exist. So that's actually typical in speech applications, right? That a speech recognizer has a vocabulary it knows about. Those are the words for which it knows how they're pronounced, right? If, if it doesn't know how a word is pronounced, it's not going to recognize it anyway. It's just not in the vocabulary. It doesn't exist. So you're building your language model only over words that you know about. And so those are referred to as closed vocabulary tasks. But in a lot of other places, you're in the world of open vocabulary tasks that you want to be predicting the probability of getting unknown words that you didn't see at all in the training data. And so they're referred to as OOVs, and they're commonly represented as the token UNC, sometimes with XML-style angle brackets around it. Um, well, so the way that this is most commonly done is to effectively regard UNC as an extra pseudo word, which UNC really represents the equivalence class of all never-before-seen words, right? So UNC, so when you're setting up a probability model, you can define your own event space. And so your event space here is, OK, there are particular words that I know about that are my vocabulary. And each time you see a word, you're either seeing one of those words or you're seeing something else, and the entire of something else is bundled as a single event in your event space, and so that's then referred to as UNC. And so you can estimate a probability for UNC. You can use the good Turing idea for how likely you are to see novel words. You can do it using held out data by looking through some held out data and seeing how often you see novel words. But you can come up with an estimate for UNC. Um, if you do that, um, the estimate for UNC is going to be high, because since it's actually this equivalence class of anything previously unseen, that you should expect that to be a kind of a big number. That is, its probability will be significantly higher when estimated than the probability of words that you've only seen once. OK, in many cases, people don't actually have only one UNC. They end up with several UNCs. They have one UNC for some unknown number or some unknown date or various other kinds of symbols, as well as things that are more words. Um, specifically for the programming assignment, it's just fine um, to say, OK, we only have one UNC. That's all there is. And let's just work with that and do things. Um, this might all seem a little bit. Um, unsatisfying, um, and in a way it is a bit unsatisfying, you might wonder of, well, can, can we actually come up with estimates for individual new words? Um, and you can, and sometimes people do. So one way that people do that is using spelling models. So that the idea is, well, let me predict. I, I can assume that the space of English letters is fixed. So let me assume that I can then kind of spell out new words a letter at a time. And so if I make a little character level language model of sequences of letters, that will give me a probability of seeing any new letter sequence. And so I can build such a model and divide the total mass of unks between those different things. And that's sometimes done. Um, another, th another if you do that, your models are really, really low in terms of your probabilities for each individual unseen word because you're giving some probability mass to every letter sequence effectively. So another idea that's certainly been pursued is to say, well, can't we actually really estimate how big people's vocabularies are and give a word to an estimate to unknown words? And there's actually a well-known, oh man, I'm blanking on his name. What's the name of the guy in the Stanford Stats Department who did bootstrap methods? Brad Efron. Brad Efron, yeah. One of Brad Efron's earliest papers um, is actually titled, How Many Words Does Shakespeare Know? And um, the entire goal of the paper was to try and, based on the number of words that are in the vocabulary of extant Shakespeare texts, was to try and predict what his total vocabulary size was. Um, but I mean, to, um, to um, summarize the paper very briefly, um, the short answer is kind of you can't. Depending on what parametric model you 
presume underlies the vocabulary. You just get estimates that are all over the place um, for his vocabulary, and you really can't uh, estimate it accurately. So really, if you want to play that game, there's sort of no, I think there's no better science than just sort of almost picking a number out of the out of your head of saying, hmm, maybe the person knows twice as many words as we've actually observed. Okay. Um, so that's the end of language models. Apart from, I'll just show you one little side thing before I get into MT. Um, so does everyone know what the Turing test is? A less known fact is um, there's actually been an attempt for a bunch of years now to actually implement the Turing test which has been referred to as the Leibniz Prize. And the Leibniz Prize was sponsored by Hugh Leibniz, who's this guy who really has nothing to do with AI. He made his money actually doing shows on Broadway, but somehow he had heard of the Turing test, and he decided that he had set up the Leibniz Prize to have um, people compete for um, compete to do the Turing test. And if, and if you can succeed in doing it, it's got a million dollar prize. But I guess the problem is um, that no one's really close to succeeding. And the yearly prize um, for having the best, the, the most human-like computer of the ones that enter is only $2,000. And $2,000 isn't enough money um, to produce a lot of serious work. Um, so it tends to be a bit of a hobbyist competition of doing the Leibniz Prize. Um, but nevertheless, the Leibniz Prize has taught us some things that Alan Turing did not think of. Um, and one of the things that um, it's taught us is that, you know, the Turing test, as he set it up, he kind of forgot the HCI angle, the kind of HCI human communication angle of what happens when people communicate. And so the way it's set up in the Leibniz Prize um, there are a bunch of judges, and they communicate by typing. So it's you know kind of like doing it um, with instant messaging. And on the other side, there might be either a human being who's the confederate or a computer. And so there'll be some number of computers and an equal number of confederates in the competition. And the judge's job is to rank rank the confederates and computers in order of humanness. And if the judge is doing a good job, um, all the humans are above all the computers. And if the, if the computer is succeeding in passing the Turing test, um, the computer ranks above some of the humans. Now, yeah, so the interesting thing that this has shown really is sort of the kind of social side of communication side of things rather than actually the artificial intelligence. So although no computer in aggregate over the judges has come close to um, beating a human in terms of humanness, there actually have been multiple instances in which for some particular judge that they have judged a computer as more human than one of the human beings. And so I guess you can kind of think of that as either the judge failing failing the Turing test, or you can think of the human being who's the confederate failing the, the, the Turing test because they couldn't convince the judge that they were human enough. Um, one of the most celebrated instances of this, actually, um, was that the confederate was an English prof, and they got onto the topic of Shakespeare. And um, after, after the end of each session, there's kind of, you know, they collect debrief from the judges. And the judge remarked, no human being could possibly know as much about Shakespeare as that. <laughs> and he was graded down um, beneath a couple of the computers. Um, and, yeah, and so other stuff has been discovered. So one of the people who's done um, quite a bit of, um, done some of these hobbyist entries is one of my fellow compatriots, um, Jason Hutchins, who did this for a number of years. So um, one year he won for being the most, um, the most human computer, um, and that wasn't the entry that I'm showing here. Um, for that entry, and I think that this is um, true for quite a number of the systems that have done best in this, I mean, effectively, they're kind of souped-up ELISA systems, which do a lot of template matching and then give appropriate answers. And essentially, what's been discovered 
is that the way you can kind of do well in this competition is by manipulating the communication and dialogue. So to the extent that the computer can seize control of the conversation, you can kind of keep up a pretty good charade of appearing human. And so essentially you portray a sort of a slightly schizo jumpy personality and you know, the human being says something and you say, oh, I'm not interested in that. Have you seen any good movies lately? And they say something and you say, oh, I'm not into movies like that. What about Full Metal Jacket? Um, and they say something and then you say, well, we shouldn't spend all the time talking about movies. Um, are you into sports? Um, and you know, to the extent that you can kind of keep that up for a few minutes, you can sound actually surprisingly human. Um, and Jason did that one year and one, um, but you know, um, as a, at, at the time, as a, um, as a bright, young, interested in these kind of things student, um, he tried to do different things each year. And another year, um, he came up with this system, which was called MegaHAL. And here's MegaHAL at work. Who won the Nobel Prize in physics? Heike Kameling owners win the Nobel Prize. What did Kameling owners discover? Heike Kameling owners discovered superconductivity in 1911. Who explained superconductivity? Werner Hunker explained superconductivity in 1911. Who is Scalpino? Werner Hunker explained superconduct superconductivity to Scalpino. Did Scalpino win the Nobel Prize? The Nobel Prize for Physics in 1900 was won by Röntgen. Um, various other stuff. Um, the theorem of Pythagoras. Pythagoras sacrificed 100 cows after discovering his theorem. Chao mi capisci. Mi pare non mi capisci. My Italian's not very good. Um, 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 so what do you think Mega Hal is doing here? Can you get a, can you kind of suss out what it's doing? Yeah? No. It, it may have had some of that data in it. Um, so what it's doing is it's being an n-gram language model. It's a pair of n-gram language models which have a lot of data in it, some of which may well have been derived from Jeopardy. And so what it's doing is um, for each time, you know, it's taking the user's sentence, it's finding one content word in the user's sentence, and then it's running a Markov model, n-gram model in both directions. So there are two n-gram models, one that can run forwards and one can run backwards in both directions, and they stop after a bit, and that gives the sentence, and that's the reply that it gives. And some of them are a bit crazy. This, this entry wasn't as successful um, as the, um, the more Eliza-like one, but it can sort of put together text. Yeah. I mean, in, in 2008, I think that would be a very successful strategy. I mean, this is actually from, you know, to be honest, I, I think this is around 97, 98. You know, it's actually now a bunch of years ago. Yeah, the, long, the longest story of Jason Hutchins was after he graduated as a PhD. This is a salutary tale. After he graduated with his PhD, he went and worked at an AI game company. And... You know, it seems to have gone from there. I guess I tried to look him up on the web when I was doing this lecture, and it seemed like the only thing I could find um, that he was doing now was writing a cooking blog. So be warned, if you go and work for an AI game company, you'll end up writing cooking blogs. Um, yeah. <laughs> There aren't that many errors, but that is just the n-gram language model. In particular, I think it's just a trigram language model. Yeah, there's, I mean, you know, I can, yeah, to dwell on this for a moment. You know, for the example I showed earlier, I sort of said languages have these long distance contexts and you need it to fully understand languages. That's true. On the other hand, I mean, I think for a lot of linguists, it's been a real eye-opener or that they're still kind of in denial as to how well these n-gram language models work. Because the fact of the matter is, you know, there's no explicit representation of grammar whatsoever, but simply if you're learning up these n-gram probabilities, you're 
kind of inefficiently and badly in some sense because you're spewing around billions of parameters. But you're nevertheless, you're learning all the grammar as you go along. That you know, you learn that after a form of the verb to be, you can get present participle forms of verbs, I am singing, and you can get passive participles, you know, I was hit, that you don't get um, other forms, like you don't get I was make, right? You know, you just pick up all of that stuff as n-grams. And so, yeah, the thing to notice here is, well, actually, this is pretty grammatical stuff. Um, and you should notice that, too, when you do the assignment, um, since one of the things in the assignment is to generate text. Um, and what you should find is, by the time you have a decent trigram model, that, you know, although the sentences will normally make not very much sense, and, you know, quite a few of these um, don't make very much sense either, um, you know, some of them are okay, but some of them um, don't make very much sense, um, that they'll nevertheless come out sort of grammatical. Okay, let me now get on to, back to MT. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of guessing the example. Well, I mean, obviously it can generate different things after superconductivity. That much is clear. I mean, one, an effect that it is worth being aware of is that, you know, these models clearly can be overtrained. So if they've only seen the word superconductivity a few times, even if you smooth a large percentage of the probability mass will go to the words that you have seen. And so if you'll then go off into a very technical topic, that these models will have a tendency to start reproducing a sequence of words that they saw verbatim, because essentially there are enough kind of very topic-specific words that nearly all the probability mass is just to sort of stay within that topic and reproduce the sentence verbatim. And I think that's kind of what you're meaning, right? But nevertheless, it was a smooth n-gram model, so it can sort of then move off and generate other words. Okay, so we saw right in the first lecture this idea um, that we have a corpus of parallel texts, and what we're going to want to do is use this corpus of parallel texts in the same kind of data-driven way to learn translation models. And in particular, we're going to want to learn from these alignment models. So the little black bars are then alignment models, which show which words translate which other words. And our goal, and we can, so we can think of those as having models of probability of French given English. And if we put together a language model, probability of English, with a, a, line, a, a word translation model, probability of French given English, we then have the two key ingredients for having a system that can translate from French to English. And so this is what we want to build. So how are we going to do that? Um, the first part of it is, um, well, we need a lot of parallel data to be able to do this. Um, and how can we get a lot of parallel data? Um, well, you know, if you know someone that speaks another language, you can ask them to translate some sentences for you. Um, that might get expensive if you want a lot of parallel data. You can actually find lots of parallel data. I mean, it turns out that there are just an enormous number of companies that, for various reasons, produce parallel data, right? So software manufacturers will translate their manuals, as we discussed. Lots of other equipment manufacturers will do the same. People want to advertise in different languages. And so you can kind of 
go out on the web and find parallel data. And if you want to work in the not the most frequent languages, often this is what you want to do. So this, if you want to build something like a Tagalog to English translator, pretty much you need, the way to get parallel data is you have to start crawling the web looking for places where there's parallel data. Um, for some of the commonest language, but you have to do a lot of work this way because there's all kinds of messy stuff in web pages. Um, but for sort of well resource big languages, a lot of the time what people use, um, certainly at universities and big corporations, is stuff from this place called the Linguistic Data Consortium, which is, um, hangs off the University of Pennsylvania. And essentially, they do a business of having big sets of data and distributing it. And so for major language pairs like French, Arabic, Chinese, my graph is out of date, but there's sort of 100, 200 million words of parallel data that they've collected. And then you can just get on a handy DVD and have lots of material to build a translation model for. There's also actually now those, so this stuff though costs a little bit of money, not a lot of time, but a little bit of money. There's actually now starting to be even some good free resources. And in particular, the best source of that is from the European Union. So that there are data sets from the European Union which are completely free because a lot of the time um, government data isn't copyright and other people have done the work for you of aligning the different sentences and the different and documents in the different languages. And that's actually the data that we'll use for the assignment. Um, no. I mean, in all of this data collection, you're just putting in, well, to a first approximation, you're just putting in everything. That you're just putting in, you know, stuff you find. And, you know, although I'm saying that there's lots of material available, quite often a lot of the material that's available is imperfect in many ways, in particular in terms of genre coverage. So that for Chinese English, it's easy to get tons of data. It's all thanks to Hong Kong, right? So they produce huge amounts of bilingual data um, through their legal system, their parliamentary system, their newspapers, etc. cetera. Um, well, first of all, there are dialect problems between different kinds of Chinese. But secondly, you know, is a ton of law reports actually wonderful data if you want to be translating instant messaging conversations, not really. It's the same problem of having the right data. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just taking whatever sentences there is, partly because, you know, eventually what you want to do is you want to learn idiomatic translations. But to some extent, what these statistical models end up being is kind of like example-based learning. And so that if you see examples of idioms to translate something, you can just learn that, and you will. I mean, people do do a, a bit of data cleanup um, but it's normally fairly crude. I mean, the kind of data cleanup that is done is it turns out that when people translate things that commonly entire sentences or entire clauses of sentences will disappear. You know, sometimes it's not clear whether they disappeared because the translator just goofed and forgot to do that bit or whether the translator somehow um, made a decision that some of that detail wasn't important and just to abbreviate things, but you'll certainly see these cases where the French sentence is 50 words long and only the first clause of that was translated into English and your English translation is only 10 words long and people will try and clean up stuff like that because it's sort of perfectly obvious that most of the French just isn't being translated. Okay, so from some source we've got a pile of, a pile of stuff in one language and a pile of stuff in a second language. Um, what do we need to do then? So we have to do some kind of data cleanup because we kind of represent our sentences as sequences of tokens. I mean, if you're doing English, um, that's not so hard. And you know, even in English, it turns out there's a bunch of stuff that's not completely trivial. So you have to kind of separate off pieces of punctuation. Generally, you want to separate off and keep pieces of punctuation because having the punctuation there actually helps you because it reveals some of the structure. I mean, these ones sort of mainly seem obvious as to how to separate them off, but things get a bit more subtle with, you know, this period is used for all sorts of uses, decimal points, internet, 
IP addresses, abbreviations like etc. when it's not the end of a sentence. Hyphens are used for various things. Um, some other languages are as easy as English. Um, other languages aren't as easy as English. Um, notably, East Asian languages don't put spaces between words. Putting spaces between words was actually something that was invented um, in the Middle Ages. Um, so if you go back, ancient Greek as it was written by ancient Greeks was like this. It wasn't written with spaces between the words. And so it was the Romans that initially had the idea of maybe you should do something to mark word boundaries. And so they'd chip a little dot in the stone between words, but not put any word spacing in. And so it was then really monks that had this idea that spaces between words um, would make things easier. Um, but people can read this stuff, ancient Greeks and Chinese people. Um, okay, but normally we want to have word-based models, and so we need to do word segmentation, um, which is actually a task, task that Bijun's worked on quite a bit, um, and we'll come back to that kind of task later. Um, for the moment, we'll just assume that we've chopped our Chinese text into words if we need to. Okay, so we now have on both sides a sequence of words um, that are translations of each other. And so the next step is to work out um, how, uh, how do these things translate each other. Um, the first thing to know is, you know, these human translators, you'd think that if you gave them a sentence in one language, they'd just translate into a sentence in the other language. I mean, isn't that too much to ask? But it turns out that human translators don't do that. It is just quite regularly the case that they will combine two sentences in one language into one sentence in the other, or they'll decide a sentence is too long and awkward if it's translated as one sentence and they're split into two sentences. And sometimes they even do more complex things. So that they'll take a clause of one sentence and move it into the other sentence. And so you have this first problem of doing sentence alignment, of working out which sentences are translations of which other sentences, including, as I mentioned, sentences are sometimes just dropped altogether. Um, I'm not really going to talk about this. Essentially, you can do this as a dynamic programming problem. So this is essentially classic edit distance, right? So you can have substitutions, insertions, deletions, combining. You can do an edit distance problem and work it out. You can read about that if you want. But we're going to assume we already have sentence aligned data. OK, so this is then what we're building for our whole MT system. So as I introduced in the first class or second class, our goal for, for what we're going to do for the assignment is to build one of these noisy channel MT systems. So what we're doing is we're going to start with bilingual text and we're going to learn a translation model of how words from one language translate into the other. And then right at the moment, you should be working on assignment one. And we're also building uh, an English language model. And so if we put those things, two things together, we'll be able to translate sentences. And so actually, what we're going to give you is the stuff to put it together. Um, so at the end of assignment two, um, you should have a little MT system. Now, your expectations shouldn't be so high as to how this MT system will work. Probably not good enough for translating stuff you send home to your grandmother or something. But um, nevertheless, it should work and give you a little MT system. OK, so, and so the idea here is when we want to translate, we're going to be translating from Spanish to English. We'll start off with our Spanish sentence. The translation model will turn Spanish words into English words. And then we'll use the language model to put these English words into a good order. It sort of checks that we're getting kind of grammatical, plausible output, and can help choose between different translations. OK, so effectively, um, this use of a generative model in Bayes' rule it seemed a neat idea because it allowed a division of labor. So that the general idea is that we can use a translation model whose only job is to suggest good candidate translations. It says, OK, you've seen the word ferme. Here are possible translations for it. Close, shut, um, finish, 
Um, those are possible translations. Think about some of those. And so it's only kind of doing uh, how to translate a word, perhaps in context, but how to translate a word task. And then we can have the English language model that says, OK, given the stuff that you're translating, I can, I can choose the words that go well in this context, and I can rearrange them in a good order based on the grammar rules of English. So the language model actually knows that adjectives before nouns sound good in English, whereas adjectives after nouns sound really bad in English, even though they sound good in French and Spanish and other languages. And so it was a kind of a division of the problem that seemed a useful way to do things. And so essentially all, MT, all statistical MT work um, through about 2001 used this kind of generative model story. Modern work has actually moved away from that, and I'll talk a bit about that later, but you guys won't be doing it in terms of what you implement. OK. Um, so we have the translation model and the language model. So if we have these two things, um, the bit that we're going to provide to you that is left over is the tricky bit, effectively. The bit down here is normally called the decoder. Um, language and speech people talk about decoders. And when they say decoders, what that means is search problem. Because all we've got is these two probability models and uh, Spanish sentence. And what we're wanting to do is say, according to these um, two probability models, what is the English sentence that maximizes this score? Turns out there ain't a good way to find it. So actually, this is an exponential search problem. And people use various heuristic methods to do a half-decent job at working out what's the best translation according to the model. OK. Um, so for the rest of today, what I want to start talking about is how we take our parallel sentences, we've already sentence divided them, and build alignment models. And from those alignment models, we then build probabilities of one word translating another word. So this is the idea of an alignment. So we've got our source language sentence. Here it's German. Um, and our English language sentence is up here. And essentially, what we're wanting to do, if you think of it as a grid like this, is put dots into this grid as to which words translate which words. So, ja, that translates as well. Ich, I, think, right? We're sort of translating the words, and it starts off in the same word order, so it goes up the diagonal, and then some more funny German stuff happens. And our goal is to, what our goal in learning will be is to work out what those word alignments are. Because if we know the word alignments, we can then use these aligned words to predict how to translate a word. And then we can get probability of English word, probability of foreign language word given English word. OK, so um, here's another way of visualizing alignments where you're just drawing lines between the two sentences. Let me just say for a couple of minutes what happens in the space of when you take sentences. So it's just like at the sentence level, if you think that you can translate languages word for word and have one word translate as one word, it doesn't work out too well for you. So here we have um, French English, um, Japan shaken by two new quakes. This is the really easy kind of case. If everything were this easy, we'd have really good statistical MT systems. So here, basically every word translated as one word, um, and they occurred in the same order, no reordering. The only thing that happened was it turns out in French, um, you put a definite article, a the, in front of company name, so uh, country name. So this is Japon, le Japon, da Japan. Um, so that's a kind of a word that came from nowhere in the French. Um, and they're referred to in these MT models as spurious words, um, words that kind of have no source in the English. And you keep on seeing different cases. You can, not surprisingly, get examples that go the other way. So here we have um, multiple words in French, I mean in English, that are translated by one word in French. As I'll make clear in a minute, um, the models that we're going to develop actually can't handle this case. 
So the models that we're going to do, because of the way we set up the alignment models, have this annoying and linguistically inappropriate asymmetry, that they can handle this case, they can handle um, an English word going to several um, French words, but they can't handle this case. And so we just simulate this case by treating it as a one-to-one -one alignment and then say the other word doesn't translate. It's a zero fertility word. And that's obviously yucky and not what's really happening in languages. Okay. Um, and then here's kind of the M to N case, which is, I guess, the most complicated kind of alignment that you can get. These little kind of bits of aligned stuff in the original work on statistical machine translation that was done at IBM were referred to as sets. Um, and other people commonly refer to them as beads or statistical phrases or words like that. Okay, so this, this is just the kind of the, um, comic view of how machine translation is going to work. We start with some parallel text and we start thinking anything can translate anything. But what we do is we look at our text and say, hmm, the word the, you could reason, maybe it's being translated as, as la, maybe it's being translated as maison. Um, house, maybe it's being translated as maison, maybe it's being translated as la. But well, look a bit more closely. Um, if we said that house was being translated as maison, we could make the probability of maison given house as high as we want. In fact, we can make it one for this data because there's kind of nothing contesting with it. And then we could also make the probability of la given the for this data one because there'd be nothing contesting with it. So we can maximize the probability of the data if we assume that la and the are aligned and maison and house are aligned. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to use expectation maximization learning to implement this kind of pigeonhole idea um, where we, we gain value if we can translate words consistently. Um, now, of course, words aren't translated consistently, so it doesn't work as perfectly as this cartoon. But that's the idea of what's going to drive our learning. Okay, that settles down. Okay. Um, okay, let me just summarize this important um, fact. Just remember this so you're not completely confused. The confusing thing about this setup is what we're doing is we're taking a French sentence and wanting to translate it into an English sentence. Um, if you are naive and think you're doing that, you think, hmm, what I'd want is probability of French word given English word. Note crucially that what we're going to estimate is exactly the opposite. We're going to estimate probability of French word given English word. Why is that? It's because we're playing this Bayes rule inversion game. So our model is that we've got the probability of English times the probability of French given English. And then we're going to take the argmax over that product to find the most likely probability of English given French. So, that, so this is the opposite. These tables are the opposite way around to how we want to translate. That makes sense? Um, it's easy to get confused on that point. I get confused every year at some point when I'm talking to somebody. OK. Um, so the next section goes through these famous IBM models, which were developed in the late 90s when they developed this sequence of better machine translation models. And we'll at least briefly go through all of them. But in the last few minutes, I want to introduce um, IBM Model 1. So IBM Model 1 is going to give these probabilities of a French sentence given an English sentence. There's a set of English words and the extra English word null. So null will be the source of the spurious words, which don't actually come from any English words. Um, and so what we are wanting to do is we're wanting to work out a probability of a French sentence given an English sentence. And we're going to do that 
in terms of assuming an hidden alignment. So this is where this EM idea is going to come in. Our hidden data is how the English and French words align to each other. So we're going to say the probability of French given English is the sum over all possible alignments, exponential number of those, um, of the probability of French and the alignment given the English. Um, and so at that point, we can then break this apart and work it out in terms of individual words. In particular, our model one makes some, some very strong assumptions which allows it to be very easy to estimate and in fact makes it not exponential anymore. So let us assume that every one of these alignments is independent from each other. That makes things easy. So now we can just say it's a product over J of each one of these alignments. Okay, so how are we going to represent alignments is we're going to have these A variables. And the A variables say AJ equals I. So this, um, what we do is say that A5 equals 6. And so that corresponds to this line. A3 equals 4. That corresponds to this line. So the variable is saying what English word each French word is aligned to. And this is exactly where you get this asymmetry immediately. Um, that because you have this representation of the alignment variables, you can have multiple French words aligned to one English word, but you, can't, you just can't represent the reverse, right? Because the value of the, this is a variable with a value, and its value is a number that is some English word. Okay, so, we, so, so the, the probability of a French sentence with a particular alignment to the English sentence is that you just, you've got the alignment, you've got the French sentence, you just take the product over each one of these, where you take the probability that AJ equals I times the translation probability of what's the probability FJ given EI. Okay, um, then to make model one super, super simple, um, we make one further assumption our next assumption is we say, let's suppose we have no substantive model over which alignments occur. So we're just going to put a uniform distribution over possible alignments. So all the probability of AJ equals I is just going to be uniform. And so you can work it out in terms of the length of the sentence as a uniform distribution. So the 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 probabilities are just in terms of this. And this term essentially just goes away because since it's uniform, you don't actually have to keep it around because it's not going to be changing what you're choosing. Um, and so that then leads um, to this slide here, which I will just put up. Um, yeah, um, I think it's probably more sensible um, if I go through um, this slide right at the beginning of next time, and, but I will nevertheless point it out. So for the first part of the assignment, what you do is have to do model one, and then you go on and do model two. Um, for model one, it is really the case um, that if you just take this slide and you know, frame it and stick it above your monitor and implement this, um, your model one will be correct and work. Um, but if you want to be a thoughtful person, um, you should do a little bit more work um, and actually read um, the Kevin Knight material um, and actually work out why this is correct. Um, this is correct. You can do this and it works. But if you actually start thinking about it in the model, um, it's not immediately obvious in terms of um, how the model is presented, as in Kevin Knight, as to why this is correct. It essentially ends up being correct that because of the fact that all the alignments are uniform and the sentence length you don't have to consider and various things, that all the other stuff goes away. And in terms of a, a re-estimation equation, this equation here works. Um, but I do encourage you to actually sort of read through and try and understand why some of this works. Okay, so if there aren't any questions up to here, um, I'll stop here now and then...
next time I'll start with going through model one, go through the various IBM models.